Welcome to lecture 4.3, Generalized Eigenvectors. We will continue our assumption that A is an endomorphism of an n-dimensional vector space X over an algebraically closed field K, and as such, we can think of it as an n by n matrix. We can also think of K as the complex numbers, because that's really the only algebraically closed field that we are all that familiar with. Let I be the set of polynomials over K such that P of A equals zero. We will say that these polynomials vanish on A or that A vanishes on the polynomials. Either is fine. What I don't want to say is that A is a root of the polynomial because linear maps and matrices are not roots of polynomials. Numbers are. We are using the letter I to denote the set because technically it is an ideal of the ring of polynomials over K. If you don't know what an ideal is, that's fine. Loosely speaking, it's a set that is closed under addition and subtraction and also closed under multiplication by anything else. And that's easy to verify. If you have two polynomials that vanish on A, so does their sum and so does their difference. And if you take any polynomial that vanishes on A and multiply it by any other polynomial over K, that will vanish on A as well. Since the ring of polynomials over T is something called a principal ideal domain, every ideal is generated by a single element. And so, so is I. So that means that for some polynomial M A of T, Everything that vanishes over I has the form F of T times M A of T, where F of T is some polynomial over K. And conversely, everything of this form will vanish on A. We will assume that this polynomial is monic, which just means that the coefficient of the highest degree term is one. So I'll call the highest degree term K because I don't want to reuse N, which means something else. And we can make this assumption because we are over a field K. So if this isn't one, we can just scale it by something suitable to make it one. We call this polynomial the minimal polynomial of A. By definition, all polynomials that vanish on A are multiples of the minimal polynomial. If you don't have a ring theory background, then you might not feel comfortable with me pulling out terms such as ideal and PID to argue for the existence of a minimal polynomial. So now I will do it from scratch without these ring theoretic ideas. It's a little bit longer, but it still should be done. First, let me start with a definition of what the minimal polynomial actually is. So we will say that it is the unique monic polynomial in I of minimal degree. Now, in this definition, I've claimed that this thing is unique, and I should actually probably prove that. So I will verify the existence and uniqueness of such a polynomial. So let's start with uniqueness. That's easier than existence, it usually is. So let's suppose that we had two minimal polynomials. Let's let m a of t and n a of t be minimal polynomials then they are both monic. So if we subtract them, we get something of strictly lower degree. Then m a of t minus n a of t has lower degree. And it also is an i. Because the degree of m is minimal for all things that are non-zero, it's implied that it's non-zero because you're not going to have zero polynomial is not going to be monic. 
then this has to be zero. So then m a of t minus n a of t equals zero. Now, if the difference was non-zero but not monic, we could again suitably scale by it to make it monic, contradicting minima minimality. So that's uniqueness. Let's now do existence. And this is basically from the division algorithm, which is something that you know and love in the integers. The division algorithm, I'm going to do it up here. And I will do it for the integers first. So this says that if we are given n and a non-zero d, then we can write n as q d plus r. In other words, we can divide d into n and get the quotient and the remainder. And the remainder is going to be between 0 and d. It's going to be strictly less than d. So for example, let's say that n equals 53 and d equals 5, we can write 53 equals 10 times 5 plus 3, and 10 is the quotient, and 3 is the remainder, which is less than 5. And the reason why this works is because the integers and any polynomial ring over a field is something called a Euclidean domain. There is, and that just means well, it doesn't just mean, but one thing that we need for that is some norm function. In this case, that's absolute value, so we can compare the remainder to d. And for a polynomial ring over a field, that norm function is going to be just be the degree. Let's now move down here and see why the division algorithm guarantees the existence of a minimal polynomial. And actually, I should clarify what I said. It is clear that there is a that there is a polynomial of minimal degree in I because the natural numbers are well ordered, and we've claimed that it is unique. But what we actually haven't shown is the statement that all polynomials that vanish on A are multiples of this. So. So that's what I mean by existence, existence of a minimal polynomial here that also has this property. So in other words, let's take any polynomial that vanishes on A, that's non-zero, and let's show that it has to be a multiple of MA. So let's take any P of T, which is non-zero, such that P of A equals zero. And let's write, or let's divide m a into p of a. So let's write p of t equals some q of t times m a of t plus the remainder r of t. And by assumption, the degree of r is less than the degree of m a. Now the thing that goes wrong here is that we can solve for R, and I will henceforth drop the of t's because we don't need them on every element. So I will just write r equals p minus q times m a. And this is an i. In other words, this vanishes on a because p does and m a does. And so m times m a times q does. And so the difference of this does. So here we have come up with a polynomial in I that has degree less than the minimal polynomial that vanishes on A. So by construction of MA, that means that R has to be equal to zero. And that's exactly what it means for P to be a multiple of MA. Let me finish this slide with one quick comment, and that is we already know a polynomial that vanishes on A, namely the characteristic polynomial. So let me write this up here, corollary. 
the minimal polynomial of A, whatever the heck it is, has to divide the characteristic polynomial. Because by the Cayley-Hamilton theorem from the previous lecture, the characteristic polynomial vanishes on A. Let's now do some examples. And these are ones that we have already done. And we have found their eigenvalues and eigenvectors in a previous lecture. So both of these have characteristic polynomial t minus 1 squared. In other words, a double eigenvalue of 1. And let's compute their minimal polynomials. So the minimal polynomial, from what we just showed, has to divide the characteristic polynomial. In other words, the minimal polynomial of each is going to be either t minus 1 or t minus 1 squared. Let me write that down for both of these. And we know that t minus 1 squared will vanish on a, so all we have to do is check whether t minus 1 vanishes on a. And of course, if it does, m a of, of a, so if, if a minus i is equal to 0, well, well, that's the same thing as saying that a equals i, which is this matrix here. So in other words, this is going to be the minimal polynomial for the identity matrix. And the other one, t minus 1 squared, is going to be the, the minimal polynomial of this matrix, because a does certainly not vanish on t minus 1. Now, these two matrices both have trace 2 and determinant 1. And any matrix that's 2 by 2 with this determinant and trace has lambda equals 1 as a double root. These matrices form a two-parameter family. And the only one that has two linearly independent eigenvectors is this first one. And let's, let's see why this is true. So first of all, if the characteristic polynomial of a is t minus 1 squared, then that's t squared minus 2t plus 1. Remember that 2 is the trace of a, and 1 is the determinant of a. And the only matrix, as we just saw, that has a minimal polynomial of t minus 1 is the identity right here. So every other one will have a minimal polynomial of t minus 1 squared. And it's easy to check that every other one's going to have only one linearly independent eigenvector. Now, when I say there's a two-parameter family, what I mean by that is, let's think about what matrices have this characteristic polynomial. I claim that A can be anything, the upper left entry. So can B. So we have right there, we have two parameters that we can fix, or, or we can pick at will. But now the other entries are forced. So this bottom right entry, if the trace is going to be 2, that has to be 2 minus a. And if the determinant is going to be 1, then we have to have a times 2 minus a times, let's call this entry c, c times b equals 1. And so if we solve for c, we get that c equals, what is this, a times 2 minus a minus 1 over b. So this, this has to be a 2 minus a minus 1 over b. Let's now consider the 3 by 3 case. Suppose the characteristic polynomial of a is t minus 1 cubed. In other words, there is a triple eigenvalue of 1. Let's now move up to the 3 by 3 case, because it's a little bit more rich. Once again, I will take a matrix that has a triple eigenvalue of 1. So the characteristic polynomial is t minus 1 cubed. Since the minimal polynomial divides the characteristic polynomial, there are only three possibilities for what the minimal polynomial is. 
it's either t minus 1, t minus 1 squared, or t minus 1 cubed. And I will do these one by one, or I will give an example of a polynomial that satisfies this. Later, we will learn how the number of eigenvectors for a repeated eigenvalue determines the characteristic polynomial. Or it doesn't determine it, but it, it, it says a lot about it. In this case, it will determine it. When I say the number of eigenvectors, I mean, if you take all the eigenvectors, do they span a one, two, or three-dimensional space? Okay, the first one, if m of a, if you plug a in here and you get zero, then that means a minus i equals zero, and that means a equals i. So the only matrix that satisfies this that has t minus 1 as a minimal polynomial is going to be the identity matrix. So one's on the diagonal and zeros elsewhere. Let's now do the second case. So what matrix has minimal polynomial t minus 1 squared? It may not be clear where I'm getting this from, but I'm going to write down one example. So let's take the identity matrix as before, but let's stick a one on top of one of the diagonal elements. So I claim that this matrix, if I, if I take a minus i, well, let's, let's see what happens. If I take a minus i, so, so if I subtract off ones from the diagonal, then I get zeros everywhere except a one in that one entry and it's easy to check that if I square that matrix, a minus i, then I get 0. So this matrix will satisfy the second minimal polynomial. And finally, the third matrix, let me do that in a different color this time. Now, I'll, I'll use the same color because I might highlight later in blue. For the third one, I claim that if we do a similar construction, but we stick a one, so we take the identity matrix, and we stick a one now on top of both diagonal entries. Now we have a matrix where a minus i has two non-zero entries, so it's zeros on the diagonal and below, but now there's zeros above the diagonal, both entries. And if we take a minus i squared, now we have, we actually get is we, we still get a non-zero matrix because there's a one in the upper right hand corner. And so clearly a minus i cubed is equal to zero. So later we will learn about Jordan matrices and these are all examples of them. So sort of a preview as to where we are going with this is this first matrix has three eigenvectors. So it is diagonalizable. This next matrix as we will see later, has two eigenvectors, and so it is not diagonalizable, but it will be similar to a matrix with in block diagonal form with these, this is called a Jordan block, and we'll talk more about what this is later. And then the last one is like a three-dimensional version of this, and here we just have a single one of these blocks, and we only have a single eigenvector as well. To say it a little bit differently, we have a basis of eigenvectors of this matrix, but not of these matrices. In an introductory course, it's often said that matrices like this are defective. And what we will see in this series of lectures is that when that is the case, we can find something that are called generalized eigenvectors to make up for it and get a basis. So that's the topic of this lecture. So I think now it's time to define what those actually are. Before we actually define it, let me motivate it with an example. Let's suppose that we have a linear map with an eigenvalue lambda that has multiplicity m but only one eigenvector, which we will call v1. So I'm assuming that m is bigger than 1 because of the but only in here. This means that v1 is in the null space of a minus lambda i. So a minus lambda i times v1 is 0. 
because there's only one eigenvector, the dimension of the null space of a minus lambda i is just one. And by the rank nullity theorem, the rank of a minus lambda i is m minus one. Now I should mention that when I say multiplicity m, I, I guess I'm implying that the characteristic polynomial of t is t minus lambda to the m. Because if there are other eigenvalues, then this, this is going to be larger than this. But I just want to generalize the examples that I did on the previous slide where we had a double and a triple eigenvalue. The big idea with generalized eigenvectors is when this happens, we can always find some vector v2 such that a minus lambda i times v2 equals v1. And that means that if we apply a minus lambda i twice to v2, we get zero. Also, if m is bigger than two, then we can find some v3 such that a minus lambda i times v3 equals v2. And that means that a minus lambda i cubed times v is zero, but a minus lambda i squared times v3 is not zero because it's equal to v1. Now I haven't proven that we can always find such a v2 and then a v3 and so on, but it should seem reasonable because if the null space of a minus lambda i is one dimensional, then we have m minus one remaining dimensions that don't get mapped to zero. And it seems reasonable that we can find something that gets mapped onto v1. And that is indeed the case. And that leads us to the following definition. A vector v is a generalized eigenvector of a with eigenvalue lambda if some power of a minus lambda i times v equals zero. Here's how I like to think about this. We have one eigenvector v1, and that gets mapped to zero by a minus lambda i. When we say that v2 maps onto v1, then we can write it like this. So we, we can draw a chain where a minus lambda i times v2 gets v1, and then we do it again, we get zero. And then v3 is going to satisfy, is going to map onto v2 via a minus lambda i. So a generalized eigenvector is, is some vector, let's say vm, that if we eventually apply a minus lambda i, we will eventually get to an eigenvector and then get to zero. So this is the visual that you should have with eigenvectors, or generalized eigenvectors. And of course, the, the actual eigenvectors, which we will call genuine eigenvectors, are those for which m equals one. So here is that last part of the definition. Now it's clear that generalized eigenvectors include the genuine eigenvectors. But unfortunately, there really is no term, at least as far as I know, for a generalized eigenvector that is not genuine. Now, it's something that's really useful to refer to. And unfortunately, a lot of books, and myself included, I will often speak of generalized eigenvectors sort of implicitly implying that I'm not talking about the genuine ones. So be aware of that. It should be clear from the context we say things, but it's just a little bit clunky to have to say, generalized but not genuine eigenvectors. Let's now finish by returning to our running examples and compute the eigenvectors and generalized eigenvectors. Remember, one is a double eigenvalue of both of these. So for our first one, we take a minus i times v equals zero, and that's zero, 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 zero times x1, x2 equals zero, zero, and any x1 and x2 is a solution, because any vector, if you multiply it by the identity matrix, you get back itself. So for a basis, we can take v1, we can take anything that's linearly independent, so we'll take one, zero, and v2 equals zero, one. For our second example, we take a minus i, times v equals zero, and that is two, two, negative two, negative two, times two, 
times x1, x2 equals 0, 0. And this means we have 2x1 plus 2x2 equals 0. The second equation is the same up to scalars. So we really get x1 equals negative x2. So we have an eigenvector, which is 1, negative 1. So as long as the x1 and x2 entries are opposite in sign, we have an eigenvector. So in other words, 1, negative 1 gets mapped to 0 by a minus lambda, or a, I'll just say a minus i, because lambda is equal to 1. So let me actually go up here and say here we had um, here we have v1 that gets mapped to 0, and v, v1 and v2 both get mapped to 0 by a minus lambda i. So here is our basis of eigenvectors. Now we don't have a basis of eigenvectors here. This is, this is v1, but we can find a generalized eigenvector. So let's, let's do that. Let's figure out what vector here gets mapped via a minus i to 1, negative 1. And this is going to and this vector is going to depend on our choice of scalar. So if we had used negative 1, 1, or 2, negative 2, we, we would get something different. But let's, let's check that out right now. So let's take, we want to find a vector v2 for which a minus i times v2 equals v1. So equals v1. That is 2, 2, negative 2, negative 2 times let's call it again x1, x2 equals 1, negative 1. Now once again we have um, two equations here which are the same up to scalar multiples. So we have 2x1 plus 2x2 equals 1. So let's solve for one of these, it does not really matter which one. So let's say x1 equals 1 half, I think that's minus x2. So whatever the heck the x2 value is, we, we can put anything. Let's put 1 for the x2 value. The x1 value is going to be 1 half minus that. So that's going to be negative 1 half. So this is a generalized eigenvector. It is in the null space of a minus lambda i squared. Now, clearly, the generalized eigenvectors do not form a subspace. Um, because it, zero cannot be one, but um, or, and also it depends on what choice we put here. Again, if I had put two negative two, I, I would get something else. But the point is that we don't have a basis of eigenvectors, but we have a basis for R two of generalized eigenvectors, and that is something that we will analyze and really understand well over the course of the next few lectures. So coming up next is a lecture on eigenspaces. And to motivate that, if you have a full set of eigenvectors, that means you have a basis of eigenvectors. So every vector can be written uniquely as a linear combination of eigenvectors. And that just means that our underlying space x is a direct sum of one-dimensional spaces, those spanned by the eigenvectors, so one-dimensional eigenspaces. And this generalizes when we don't necessarily have a full set of eigenvectors. We want to write our underlying space as a direct sum of eigenspaces. So let me write that as, I don't know, um, E1 up to EK. And these will consist of generalized eigenvectors. And so every vector can, will be represented uniquely as a linear combination of generalized eigenvectors. And these do not have to be one dimensional. So I think I'm going to leave it there. Stay with us.